Welcome to Sykes, the bottom line pharmacy podcast, your regular dose of pharmacy CPA advice to fuel your bottom line, featuring pharmacists, key vendors, and other innovators. Your checks, yes, you can call me, because we the best Sykes and Company. We the best Sykes and Company. Your accounting is a mess, there's no need for you to stress. Go online and request from the best. We the best Sykes and Company. We the best Sykes and Company. Yes. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Bottom Line Pharmacy Podcast. Today, we have Trenton Thede. Did I get that right? With got Ass yep. National. Uh, I kind of like that. It kind of rolls off the tongue nice. Thede. Um, it does. With Pass, and uh, I'm sure everybody here is familiar with Pass. Uh, if you've been to any trade show, um, if you were at any trade show this summer and you visited our booth, you would have seen Pass next to us because we uh, we had him at what beside us at McKesson and um, what was the other one? Drawn Hot spot. Hot spot. Hot spot. That's right. Mm-hmm. So, um, Trenton, welcome to the show. Glad to have you. Um, tell us a little bit about you know yourself, what you guys do there, and then kind of just roll roll from there. Yeah, sounds great. Well, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Um, Trent, president of PASS. I'm a, a pharmacist by training. Uh, I've spent 15 years working for a small community retailer up in Wisconsin, where I'm from. Uh, originally out of Green Bay, of course, so a big Packers fan. Um, so I worked for community pharmacy about 15 years and then uh, spent the last four or five in long-term care before coming to pass. So I ran long-term care pharmacies in the Midwest, uh, but then came to pass. Uh, I've really come to love what we do in, in helping community pharmacies, especially independents, uh, combat PBMs and, and PBM audits. So um, for those that maybe aren't familiar with PASS, it stands, the acronym stands for Pharmacy Audit Assistance Service. We've been in business for 30 years, uh, helping community pharmacies in their dealings with PBMs. Primarily when it comes to audits, we do a few other things as well, but most of us, most people know us for our audit assistance. We're pharmacist owned and managed. You know, we have uh, five pharmacists on staff, seven certified technicians, and a host of other um, ancillary staff to help support our, our pharmacies. Um, last year, we saw 10,000 audits, right? So we're using all that intel and guidance from the audits that nice. we see That's to help lot. provide insight and, and feedback back to our members. So I think audits, and I'm sure we'll talk about it, but you know, we're very much of the belief. Um, a lot of people think when they think of audit assistance, it's when they get an audit, right? Oh, I need I need audit assistance now, um, now that I have an audit in hand. And really, we very much focus a big part of our service on being proactive. And I'd love to talk to you guys about the things we do, what kind of trends and tactics we're seeing, what things pharmacy owners should be aware of um, to help mitigate their their audit risk. I know that's a common phone call I get or an email. Um, nothing that we can really do about it, but you know, the 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 pharmacy clients like, oh no, I'm you know I've got an audit and they are panicked. So yeah. um, it's not fun. So I am Look, so interested to hear about the proactive part of it because I you know. That really isn't on my radar either. So talk to us about that. So things you can do with you guys before you get the notice that this is going on. Yeah, and, and PBM audit notices are daunting, right? They can be very intense. These are the big behemoths that you're already afraid of. And so them coming into audit is a very scary feature for a lot of owners who haven't been through them or if they're coming on site, it can be very intense. So one of the things that we focus uh, our services on is being proactive. And so how do you be proactive? Audits are always retrospective, right? The claims you're billing today are the audits of a year, two years um, from now, if you're lucky. We can see audits, particularly with Medicaid, go back five years. Wow. So it's about the claims that you're billing today. So how can you be smarter about the claims that you're billing today? And part of that comes from insight and knowledge about what are the PBMs doing? What things should I do or not do? So at PASS, we write, internally, we write a monthly newsletter. Uh, it's 12 articles. We physically mail that to all of our members telling them, here's what, the, here's what the PBMs are auditing, here's what to do, here's what not to do. So a big part of that is just uh, making them aware of these audit trends and tactics and talking to them about um, general filling and billing guidance. So we can dive into some of the, each of those examples. But you know, if a pharmacy doesn't know how to bill a claim correctly or they have questions or they're not sure, um, that's part of our services. They get, once you're a member, 
that there isn't any additional charges or fees. It's an annual membership fee. We're a membership driven organization. And so however we can help, right? We're very much a servant leader. How can we help you be successful when it comes to audits, filling and billing claims correctly, and then um, being reactive, obviously, when they have an audit, um, taking them through that process. But we focus a lot of our time and attention on helping pharmacies avoid those in the first place. And we have statistics that can show the longer a pharmacy is with us, the less likely they are to be audited and the better off they are in terms of recoupments. So the less likely they are to be audited. And well, that's interesting. So these these audits aren't kind of random. They're rarely ever random, right? They're oh. very targeted, high dollar claims, um, looking at it's it's all your insulins and biologics, and they're they are not random. There are a few states that have some state laws. We very much push for PBM reform, not only at the federal level where we support it with through NCPA, but also at the state level, right? There's a ton of reform. Everyone's familiar with that. And there are some states, I love Arkansas, obviously, not only from the, the Rutledge PCMA spearheading that they had, but also they have some great laws about randomization and uh, for audits and limits on the number of claims to be audited. Um, it doesn't always translate to Medicare and Medicaid being federally funded, but for commercial claims and things like that, they're random. But most audits, to your point, Scotty, they're not random. They're very targeted. They're going for high dollar claims, looking to recoup what they can. Mm -hmm. And once they audit you a couple of times and you pass those audits with flying colors per se, they kind of just pass over you. <laughs> no <laughs> pun intended. Yeah, we always, um, next. Yeah, we always tell pharmacies. <laughs> <laughs> right. have to feel that one. We always um, tell pharmacies to challenge, right? Never make it easy. Don't make a recruitment easy because then they'll come back, right? Where, where it's easy to get it. So always fighting, but also they, they're using data analytics, right? They're using AI to yeah. comb over your claims data to say, here's a high likelihood that I can recoup from Scotty's pharmacy. And so uh, if there's no anomalies, if your claim billing history looks really good, you're also less likely to say, oh, I'm mm -hmm. going to go visit there. Well, they're going to go where they can find easy claims, where they know it's been rebuilt multiple times. They know these factors um, and are looking to, to play. We have a lot in mm -hmm. common, Trent. Um, that's very similar to the IRS, I believe. Um, you know, they have AI <laughs> and dig down. They know where to find that stuff you know, different um, sectors of different type of things, you know, Schedule C's. That's why we push our pharmacies never to be a Schedule C because, you know, they're going to come digging in places like that. Um, and we definitely are with you on the proactive side, counting. Yeah. Yeah, it's huge. Nobody likes audits. IRS audits, PBM audits, boy. Sales tax audits. Fun. Sales tax never. audits, just not fun. Yeah. Everybody wants to be out of it. So Trent, well, was, somebody somebody comes on board with pass. Um, do y'all do like a uh, initial review, kind of get in there and see what where they are, what they've done, kind of a, a checklist, kind of to get you up to speed type thing, or how does that work? I'm just curious. yeah, it's a great question. So about half of our members when when they join. Um, about half of them join when they're in an audit and half of them are joining <laughs> just for, for that proactive piece. They're familiar with it. So it depends on circumstances, right? If they're in an right. audit, we're just diving in. What do you got going on and where are you at with this audit? Sometimes people will join us pre-audit, like they just got the audit notice and they've signed up. And sometimes they've tried to go through the audit. It hasn't gone well. And now they've got results that are significant and they're looking for assistance. And we jump in at all, all stages. Mm -hmm. um, from the proactive standpoint, we send out uh, a member manual and we send out a lot of our tools and aids. One of the big things that we have are day supply charts. We often give some of them away at trade shows. But again, it comes to helping pharmacies fill and bill claims accurately. So we have a ton of proactive resources on how to handle different scenarios in the pharmacy correctly. You know, how to manage claim rejects, how to make sure that the right flags are checked when you're billing these claims. And we have these nice charts that help train staff and new technicians or experienced technicians how to make sure they're doing everything correctly to, again, lessen that likelihood of an audit. And also it's less for the pharmacist to catch, right? The more the technicians can accurately fill and bill claims up front, the less the pharmacist has to worry and, and check everything. Uh, and the more they can focus on making sure that the prescriptions dispense accurately. Interesting. So, <clears throat> so with the with the proactive piece in place, you know, what what are some trends, Trent, that you're seeing out in the marketplace right now? Um, 
I know we've had Brown and Fortunato on the podcast yeah. a month or two right. ago talking about yeah. um talking about trends in the audit space as well. What 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 got, what are you guys seeing there? Yeah, we definitely see an increase, I'll tell you, in, in fraud, waste, and abuse, I think is what Brad Brad talked a little yep. bit about. I watched that podcast. Um and in SIU or Special Investigation Unit, they're kind of similar. F- FWA or SIU depends on the PBM. Um, but similar in scope, right? They're getting more aggressive in terms of going after pharmacies. They also try and skirt state audit laws because a lot of the state audit laws carve out exceptions for fraud, waste, or abuse. So more audits are being identified that way um, so that they don't have to follow potentially state regulations. They don't typically have an obligation to show anyone that they had a credible um, suspicion of, of FWA. So if they just put FWA on the audit notice, now they're working around some of the systems. So I think one of the big things that we see right now um, is invoice audits and helping pharmacies navigate invoice audits. Invoice audits are, are by and far probably the audits that result in the most six or, or seven figure uh, potential ah. recruitments for pharmacies. Just just huge. They can devastate a pharmacy. Um, Caremark, I mean, the big three, right, are, are dominating um, audits as, as a whole, as you would expect. Um, but invoice audits, for sure, are a big problem. Optum um, is very aggressive. And, and it's invoice audits to kind of break it down a little bit. Over a specified period of time, they're looking at what did the pharmacy buy and what did the pharmacy bill for. And they're trying to match up those claims. And each PVM kind of has their own nuances to that and how they treat that invoice audit. But I'll give you an example with with Optum, who I think is the most difficult. Pharmacies have to produce um, redacted claim data for that specified time frame. So Optum, you have to take your pharmacy management system, or they'll go straight to the pharmacy management system, produce your dispensing record over, let's say, 12 months. And then they're going to have you contact your wholesaler, whoever that might be, and submit the purchasing records. And they want it straight from the wholesaler. They don't trust independent pharmacies. They won't let the pharmacies touch the files. And so the wholesaler has to send over the file to the PBM. And then the PBM does a reconciliation. And they're saying you build for um, 10 Lantus Solo Star pens. And during this period of time, you only bought nine. So you owe us one back. Um, that's where we see lots of problems with reconciliation. There's there's many issues with invoice audits and, and independent pharmacy owners rightfully get frustrated. Part of it is they don't count inventory on the shelf. I know you guys, in, in being good stewards of cash management, right? You want to have low lean inventory in pharmacies. So they're not carrying a lot, but pharmacies that do or potentially purchased another pharmacy um, or were strategically buying, all of those situations can create issues in an invoice audit if you're buying in bulk or other situations that aren't easily accounted for. Um, they create huge issues and massive discrepancies when it comes to invoice audits. And I think that's where a lot of pharmacies um, struggle with that. Well, just looking at your website, um, one of the things that I noticed that stuck out to me was um, that you guys, your data shows that you've got, what, a 89%, 90% reduction in, in audit findings? Yeah. Um, so that's huge. Um, that's a five-year average for us. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it's when we get involved at the start, right? It, it's mm-hmm. very much helping pharmacies. We review documentation before submission to a PBM. So we're looking at your scripts, looking at what you've got. And there are some components with invoice audits that can help out. Um, to make sure that you don't have discrepancies. A big part of purchasing as well, and and this goes to the proactive piece, is where you're buying from. Sometimes um, owners get caught up in just finding the lowest cost for a product, and sometimes it's not always um, the best choice, right? There may be, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. That um, saying goes, test strips is a great example. A lot of pharmacies still get burned on diabetic test strips, diabetic testing supplies, um, because they're not procuring them from the right source. As an example, uh, there was a lot of fraud with diabetic testing supplies years ago in 2015, 2016, uh, and some of the diabetic test strip manufacturers ended up suing the PBM, suing pharmacies, because they were paying more in rebates than they were selling in product. So then there was a problem, right? They were importing it from overseas. There was gray market product, you know, selling it again, repurchasing from from patients, things like that. So they put into the contracts with some of the big PBMs, you can only buy from our authorized distributor list. And so Roche, LifeScan, these entities uh, produce a list of their approved suppliers, distributors. 
and they say they're they're forbidden from reselling. So only these these entities will have legitimate product. Anyone else, and they're going to argue it's not legitimate product. They can't have it because we don't allow it to resell. And so Caremark Express Scripts, two great examples, explicitly require pharmacies to buy from that list. And the challenge is there are other OTC distributors out there that aren't um, on the list, but will still gladly sell test trips to pharmacies. And they may or may not say, hey, we're not an authorized distributor of record for this diabetic supplier, but pharmacies get caught up in that. And so now I'm not buying test trips from the right place. I get an invoice audit. I have purchases. They don't count. And so that really can add up very quickly uh, for a pharmacy that's doing a lot of that diabetic testing supplies. Um, we see it all the time. And it's just a huge miss. And, and that's being proactive, right? Knowing that because there's nothing you can do about what you bought yesterday. Yeah. All right. I can do is buy correctly going forward. Right. And it's that kind of educational components we try and provide to warn pharmacies. Because when sometimes when you're in those, um, we can't, can't fix it. All we can do is try and mitigate um, right. standards from there. Yeah. These invoice audits, man, I'll tell you, they sound like gotchas to me. I mean, I mean, you got to think 99% of the pharmacies out there have bought what they said they bought. They filled yep. it. Maybe 1% or whatever, one out of 100 is doing something they shouldn't be doing. But let's get real here. I mean, pharmacies are buying the drugs, they're filling the drugs. And so yep. these invoice audits just seem like gotchas to me. And this is just right another there. reason why PBMs are just just no it absolutely is right 99.9 percent are doing the right thing the right yeah. ways buying the drugs and it's the the point one percent that the pvm uses as fuel for the fire right hey look at these look at this fraud where there is maybe a, a situation of crime and then they get somebody caught up and i didn't have the right invoice or i didn't have my paperwork for that but i did buy it you know it, it's unfortunate so you really have two ways for people to get going with you guys trent it could be hey i've, I've got my audit in yep. hand um, kind of the, the not so proactive approach and then a proactive approach of just going ahead ahead of time and contacting you. What does that look like um, to get started? Yeah. So, I mean, we, we use NCPDP data feeds. So we have all the pharmacies and the information. Um, it's super simple because pharmacies can just go to our website and sign up or they can give us a call. We have a call center that answers our phones. Um, we promise on any contact, like a two business day turnaround. So we're very quick to respond to a pharmacy. If they have a deadline today, if they join today and said my audit's due today, we would help them. It's just what what can we do with the time that we have, given wow. your circumstances, given what you need. So we're very quick to turn things around um, when we can. We have a great team that's very experienced and knows kind of how to navigate those those processes. Um, so when they get started, they can we can really jump in predicated on circumstance. And if they have quick questions, like sometimes members will just join and I want to know what's hot right now or what, what things should I be aware of. And I'll give you a couple examples because I'm curious on one of them for sure to get your take from the accountant perspective, right? I'm sure you guys potentially hear this or see this, but proof of copay collection, right? So we're seeing more audits, particularly from Caremark uh, of the big three, um, proof of copay collection. And so one of the main things we tell pharmacies all the time is you have to get with the times. If you don't have an integrated point of sale system, you're going to run into problems yeah. with PBMs. Like you have to. We're, we're agnostic with pharmacy management systems. It doesn't matter what integrated point of sale system. You got to have something that can show evidence of copay collection. Hopefully it integrates so that you have a, a bunch of additional features. Are there um, still pharmacies out there without a PMS? Uh, no, without a PMS. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there are. And, and those guys get... Um, <laughs> unfortunately you know it's it's somebody wow. you know sky we got we got people that are potentially in their 70s and have run it all that way all along and been very successful and and my heart bleeds for them because it's like guys I, I i get it you gotta get with the times on this stuff and one of the challenges that a lot of owners face is cash payments right and this is where i, I think i'd be interested in your take right because we tell pharmacies you know cash management when you're claiming a cash copay um you got to have record and, and what Caremark looks for is, is bank deposits. And what we tell pharmacies uh, routinely is you should have a, a routine process to deposit cash into the bank, whether that's weekly, uh, I think weekly is appropriate or monthly so that you have a record of it. And you also can't dip into the till to pay another vendor, to pay someone else. You can't use it as petty cash, right? And I would imagine that that plays right into your area. And I don't know if you run into a lot of problems with that cash management, but we tell pharmacies all the time, especially when they're taking a 200, a 300. I, I see 
pharmacies with the $800 copay and they, they took it in as cash. I'm not saying you can't take cash. Where, where's your record? You know, right. encouraging and making sure you have clear documentation, just like an IRS audit, to your point. What can you show the, the PBM at that point to, to make sure that um, you can demonstrate that you collected that? And I'll back? answer that question, Trent. What yeah. we suggest pharmacies do is that they take the end of day point of sale report. They're getting that in the accounting system. And then they're tying the bank deposit every single day, ideally cash deposit, making your deposits daily, yeah, ideally. Mm -hmm. And um, you're tying that into the point of sale register each day. So everything reconciles every day. Um, yeah. And then, you know, when the audit comes, IRS, uh, PBM, you got it, you got it buttoned up. I, I love and, that. And, and if an auditor runs into that and they yeah. see that you have this process in place that you're, reconciling daily, so on and so forth. I mean, they're going to, they're just probably going to move on to the next thing. I mean, absolutely. Where, where they can't get money. I totally agree. And I think right. that's a great process. I'm glad to hear that it daily, I think is certainly ideal because then there's no question, right? If yeah. you took an $800 cash for the day, you have proof, you have evidence. And it, it's real simple to show that what I run into, as you can imagine, is they're not depositing the cash or they only deposit on a, a rare or infrequent, not routine basis. And they're not able to to reconcile and it's just a mess and and the auditors you know love that kind of stuff because then they can just keep digging deeper and ask for more um sometimes in these fwa or siu investigations they start to find things and, and it's not over so then they ask for more scripts oh you're not able to meet these show me some more show me some more mm -hmm. and those get to be really arduous really quickly for owners um so having clear policies like that really um can help sure does. you know Part D regulation, right, is 10 years plus the current plan year. So if, and that's, that's an extreme example. Those are typically true fraud. Um, but I see Medicaid routinely go back five years in certain states. And some Medicaid programs use extrapolation, which can be extremely daunting because now they're going to take, if 2% of your claims are errant, um, they'll go back. Uh, five years, well, we pay you $10 million. Now it's 2% of $10 million, um, which is a lot of money. So um, having and being very careful, most PBMs, and there are state, right, a lot of state PBM reform have tried to limit um, how long they go back. I love Louisiana's law um, that restricts a, a PBM can only go back as long as the billing window is open. So that essentially allows the billing window to be open much longer for pharmacies. Um, because they can only audit during that time frame. So that's a great state law that I love to see. But traditionally, two years. Like if, it, if it's beyond two years, um, it, it's probably an exception unless it's Medicaid. And Medicaid will go back five or unless you've got OIG or some um, audit contractor coming in um, for big suspicion of fraud. We talk about like being proactive. I, I, mean, it, it, I think it's just the way I've always done it. It's always worked for me, and and it always works until you you get handed a PBM on it, and and they will be very quick. One of the challenges too, it's it's not just financial anymore, right? Um, where hey, I'm going to pay back ten thousand dollars. Yes, it hurts if if you have the resources. Um, it hurts. I'm going to move on. We're, we're seeing more terminations, right? If your failure to collect copays, they can lead to network terminations, which is can be a domino effect. If you get terminated from any PBM network, you have to notify the other PBMs and they're going to come looking and wanting and what, why did you get terminated? And then they're going to come and audit as well, looking for those same things. So getting terminated from a network can, I don't want to say it's a death sentence, but it can be disastrous for a pharmacy. And so we see all the time, and I, I got an email this morning, actually it was late last night. I need an immediate corrective action plan. We're seeing these being required from pharmacies based on circumstances that guys, um, he only has a $2,500 invoice shortage at the end of the day. And uh, he's in New York. Uh, he might be in a heat zone, which is uh, prone to potential FWA. $2,500 is not a bad invoice reconciliation audit. I, I consider that a, a very good audit, frankly. And he's, they're demanding an immediate corrective action plan. It scares a lot of owners because it's not about the $2,500 at that point. They're not happy about it. They're willing to move on. It's about, I want to make sure I don't get terminated, that they accept my corrective action plan um, and those kinds of things. They're very much uh, big bullies, threatening and scaring pharmacies. 
and we guide them through, you know, kind of here's what a corrective action plan should look like. Caremark does lay out some guidelines for this um, and then kind of making sure that they can get that accepted so they don't fear termination. Trent, what about, um, you mentioned the copay collection. We, we I've seen, I've seen this where a pharmacy, you know, the patient can't pay the copay and they put it on account, um, AR account, you know, yeah. they make efforts to collect, they make efforts to collect and eventually they just write it off. I mean, what, what's a kind of a best practice there in your opinion? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and, and I think Caremark, I, I would say that Caremark probably is the most explicit both on, <clears throat> so if anyone wants to read it, Caremark is most explicit about, um, copay collection and about kind of this this area of accounts receivable, let's say from, from a patient, a first party charge or whatever a pharmacy will call it. One of the key things is, and I think you, you said it, Scotty, is efforts to collect. And, and to what point does the pharmacy have documentation that they've tried to collect versus it's just a a farce, or I'm, I just put it on account, but we're never really going to collect. I'll, I'll just put it over there and we'll waive it after 90 days. What would suffice, in my opinion, on a, on a care mark audit is if they put it on an account, patient doesn't have the money at the time, and, and there are certain areas, right, there are OIG safe harbors for waiving copays based on certain circumstances for Part D and LIS and Medicaid, but setting that aside, um, you've got a $50 copay for insulin and the patient needs it, or, or 35 now, and the patient needs it and they're not able, and, and independence right? Their, their hearts bleed for patients and taking care of patient care. So they're going to give them the meds no matter what. So they put it on an account. What Caremark or other PBMs will want to see, do you have policies and procedures related to that, right? To your AR system? Um, what are your policies and procedures? Do you bill them monthly, right? A good policy would be the first of every month, I'm going to send a bill to Mrs. Jones to let her know that we have a $35 outstanding balance month after month, month one, month two, and then potentially after month two, I, I place a couple of calls and say, hey, we still have an outstanding balance. I'm required to collect this. Your insurance may request the documentation, you know, and kind of coaxing that patient into hopefully making payments or coming in to pay it. And then at, you know, the potential 90 day interval, determining um, whether to write that off. And then, you know, going forward, are you going to cap that? Right. Because I think there's a couple components to a policy is like how much leeway are you going to give a patient in terms of how much you know, total limit. Mm -hmm. And what happens if you cap them? Are you never going to let them charge again, right? If they won't pay their copay, are you going to restrict them from charging? Some of those policies in there. But Caremark requires, um, you have to show efforts to collect before the audit. If you don't have anything documented that you've sent out routine statements or made calls and they audit you and you haven't collected, um, you're going to be in a, in a rough spot. Policies and procedures, proactive. That's the name of the game with the audits, I'll tell you. That is the name of the game. Well, Trent, what else? Uh, anything else you want to cover before we kind of... I'll give a couple other good good tips, I, I think, to, to think about. I think for, for owners, one of the things um, that we see Optum, and, and talking about proactive, one of the big things we see Optum do um, is going after products that must be dispensed in the original container. We talk about it all the time. I'll give you a couple of examples. Linzess, a drug, and Bictarvi. So HIV and one's for chronic idiopathic constipation. But these are drugs that from the manufacturer must be dispensed in the original container. And it's an easy algorithm for PBMs. So Linzess comes in a 30 count. If you're dispensing in 28 count, it's so easy, right? It's an easy algorithm. Oh, 28 day supply. There's no way you gave it in the original bottle. That's $3,000 of fill times 11 months times all of your patients. That can be six-figure audits. So I, I caution a lot of pharmacies that do compliance packaging. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. When you're doing 28-day, it can be a huge problem for dispensing original containers. So some systems are set up to do 28-day. If you're doing 28-day, you have to carve out your um, dispense in original container products. We have a list that we've looked up and what we see most commonly audited, but there is little um, ability to recoup. We've seen some effort, but if you don't dispense in the original container for a product that says it, and these are all right high dollar, super expensive, come in unit of use really kind of containers, um, pharmacies get torched, right? They're trying to help the patient, 
by giving them compliance packaging, trying to improve adherence. So can you not right compliance thing. package those? You should not, right? They're okay. exempt. Even, even in a skilled environment like LTC where you have a 14-day, you're, you're exempt from putting that into a short cycle um, situation. Nursing homes, in my experience working in LTC, they hate it. They, I can guarantee you it leads to non-adherence, missing meds because they're in a bulk area, this medication cart being pers- pushed down the hall, and they, don't, they only give what's in the bubbles. Um, what I'll tell you is the, the algorithm looks for quantity, right? So again, I'm not clinically, there, there's a concern, right, from the manufacturer, from the FDA, but if you're dispensing 30 days, they can't detect whether or not your compliance packaging right? 28 days, 31 days. If you're doing calendar months, that's where pharmacies get in trouble. And again, it's about being proactive, right? It's about making the right decisions today so that they don't come back a year or two years from now. It's, it's very frustrating because how easy would it be for Optum or Caremark or anyone else to put in a reject to say, hey, we only allow this to be a 30-day supply. They'd much rather entrap you, have you build thousands, tens of thousands of dollars in claims and then just come back and recoup it all, right? They're, they're by and far complicit with that. It's so frustrating and owners know it and they see it and, and it's just like printing money for them. Mm, that's interesting. That's yeah. a good point. Yeah. The other thing I'll, I'll mention um, coming out of the, the pandemic is thinking about um, mailing and delivery restrictions by PBM, right? During the, the public health emergency, a lot of pharmacies got very accustomed to not collecting signatures, um, when delivering things like that or taking a picture. Um, and the PBM provider manuals are very specific about um, you know, whether or not you can mail because there are mailing restrictions. What happens when you're mailing out of state? Um, they'll, they're happy to jump on board with non-resident pharmacy licensure issues. Um, what happens when you're delivering through contracted delivery? Those are all things pharmacies need to be aware of if they're doing heavy delivery or mailing. Um, the PBM is very much look for those kinds of issues. And again, they're they're very much entrapment. They don't call it out. They'll let you bill and build your claim liability. And then a year or two years from now, they'll send out an auditor to say, hey, I think you've got some issues here. And then they're going to come come and recoup. Um, so they're all. not proactive. They're not proactive. They're, they will, they want it. They, they're, they're happy. They're proactive in uh, increasing recoupment. They don't want to help. They're yeah, going to yeah, yeah. come get you a little later, get the gotcha. It's very much, they're, they're, yeah, it's very much a gotcha, yeah. um, unfortunately. So It is. Well, Trent, we appreciate you getting on and spending some time with us today. I reckon we'll see you at NCPA. So uh, yeah, I'll absolutely. Go to the booth and say, hey, but we, uh, again, appreciate you hopping on. And any and everybody questions? everybody out there, don't, uh, don't wait till the day the audit's due. I'm going to, you haven't told me that. I'm just going to guess. <laughs> that that's probably Wait. a preference for you guys. Um we have some of that too. People contact us and want their tax return done, you know, in a, in a day or two. So it's not, you know, preferred. It doesn't really work that way. Um, yeah. So, and anybody listening in, if you don't have a point of sale, <laughs> manager, a point of sale or yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to start there. Um, yeah. Grant, thanks again for hopping thanks on and we'll it. see you uh, out on the trade show floor. Hey guys, my pleasure. Thanks a lot for having me. Yes.